We at NASA are working hard to create opportunities for what I might call participatory exploration. We are doing this in a lot of ways. This virtual world, Second Life, is one way. So if you take that, uh, what the browser did in 93 and what some of these virtual environments are, are uh, doing today, um, it really has the, the, a transformative opportunity to take in an order or two or three orders of magnitude more data. Um, and we're able to then um, interact even more efficient because we, we are taking in a variety of different data sets and, um, and it, it's much more intuitive. It's a useful way to sort of simulate the experience of being face-to-face -face with one another and all of the sort of utility of you know, effective communication and collaboration that comes from that, which is why we have offices, why we go to meetings, why we go to conferences, um, without actually having to travel. And so for a large organization that is people widely distributed around the country and around the planet, as certainly the, the NASA and the uh, space community at large does, we thought it'd be a great way to, to prototype some of these co-working ideas without having to uh, spend a lot of time or money doing it and also to extend the potential benefit of that beyond the Bay Area. For what it is now, but really for what I think it will become in the future and the potential uh, of where virtual worlds have to go. Uh, I think the, the sort of philosophical questions that uh, virtual worlds bring up about our sense of place in the universe and how we represent information uh, and what it means to bring sort of to bring space to us rather than to send us out to space uh, and how we can kind of play with that to make space more accessible to people uh, and, and even beyond space how we can play with that to make uh, science and, and technology more accessible to people and more inspiring to people uh, is really the coolest part of it for me um, and that kind of manifests in, in questions about you know very practical questions about how we get this data into virtual world environments uh, and how we make it interactive uh, and immersive and, and in such a way that people um, can, you know, I can be standing next to an avatar who's logged in from uh, from Japan, you know, or, or somewhere in northern Canada, and uh, we can be standing next to some geologic feature and, and point it out to each other and comment on, you know, what we think it is, and, and maybe, you know, in 10 years from now, we'll, we'll also be able to share that comment with a, a digital representation of an astronaut that's, that's really standing on the surface of another, another planet. Uh, and that, that to me is the coolest, uh, coolest part of what we're doing. The Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk could not have visualized what a 747 would look like or an F-117 stealth fighter. For that fact, even the space shuttle. But I'm sure there were people on the sand criticizing them as the Wright Flyer would never amount to anything. The same is kind of true with virtual worlds as is in its present state. But it's getting to the point that, that this technology will evolve and we can do more with it. The Wright brothers could not uninvent the airplane. It was inevitable. And it's also inevitable that virtual worlds and persistent synthetic environments are coming. It's up to us and it is, is almost mandatory that we look into this technology because we cannot uninvent this.